we're live. What's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in tonight. I have got Mr. Kelly Nichols from LA Guns with me tonight. How's it going, brother? Hey, morning, Brandon. How's it going? Oh, uh, you know, just riding out this COVID wave like everybody else is right now, you know, just dealing yep. with the whole industry, just kind of being on pause at the moment. So, yep. you know, yep. just ready for everything to kind of get back to normal so we can all go uh, play all this new music we've been releasing for everybody. Yeah, exactly, man. Yeah, everybody's uh, hanging tight right now. Yeah, uh, where am I talking to you from right now? If you don't, you obviously you don't have to like disclose it if you don't want to. But <laughs> I'm always in an, I'm always in an undisclosed location. Okay, perfect. That's you can't get much more rock and roll than that. So I like that answer. I leave it to uh, your imagination. I'm out there somewhere. Cool. We'll, we'll just say you're in Australia with Mark hanging out right now. <laughs> okay. Well, cool, man. I appreciate you so much coming on and uh, giving me a little bit of your time. So anybody that's listening right now, uh, LA Guns just put out a new record on November 13th called Renegades. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit and get a little backstory on Kelly as well. So we'll go ahead and jump into some of these questions, man, if you're ready. Uh, I'm ready. Yeah, let me put this down. Go ahead. <laughs> cool. So I uh, was looking over your Wikipedia page a little bit, you know, trying to get some some history on your personal life a little. And uh, it says that you were born in France and then you moved to Georgia at the age of two. Uh, so what was what? Uh, it? Yeah, it says that you were born in France and then you moved over here at two. Yeah. Is that is that correct? Uh, yeah, came here when I was two years old on the Queen Mary. And oh, nice. To, actually, actually moved to uh, Harlem first. Oh, okay. Was, cool. Yeah. Somebody needs to update the wiki page. <laughs> you can't always trust the wiki pages, man. Yeah, uh, dude, Loudwire has a great series that they do called uh, Fact or Fiction. I don't know if you've seen it or not, where they just literally interview people and ask them if what's on their Wikipedia page is true or not. It's pretty oh, interesting yeah. sometimes. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, so what brought you over to the States from France, man? Um, the, uh, I guess, uh, what brought everybody in the, uh, sixties or whatever was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a fresh start, I guess my, my parents came, uh, and my parents wanted to come here. So my dad came like a year early and, uh, got a job and, uh, an apartment in Harlem and everything. And, um, well, I guess my mom <laughs> filled out the paperwork and it took a year to get all the, um, you know, the whatever to come here and so we did and uh you know it was it was kind of like family things and he wanted to try something different so you know he didn't speak english so it was kind of a oh wow you know, a brave move coming here and then you know with two kids uh, i have a brother who's a year younger than me so we were both under you know two to come to a new country and give it a shot you know so it was the american dream i guess yeah that's basically the 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 definition of the American dream. That's, that's great, man. That's a very cool story. Uh, so a young Kelly Nichols, when did you first start getting, getting into playing music and playing guitar and bass and all that stuff? Uh, I got it kind of later than most people. I think I, I was really into motorcycles and still am. And as a youth, I got into that first um, and I uh, was racing motocross in Georgia and I was doing all right. I was bringing, nice. home, some bringing home some trophies and uh, that was really what I wanted to be. Um, and then we, we left Georgia and moved to New York and within a week of moving to New York, uh, our, our truck was stolen, our trailer was stolen and my motorcycle oh, shit. was stolen. Yeah. Uh, so everything was gone. So I couldn't afford to, you know, plus I was in New York. So I really, couldn't afford a motorcycle and kind of figure that all out again. So my brother was already playing guitar and we actually had a friend who had a basement and played drums. So it's like, you know, what could I do to kind of, uh, to, you know, fit in and uh, ended up getting a bass. My dad took me down to the local record store, bought me like a hundred dollar little Fender bass nice. and, little amp, and we just started jamming and, uh, and then I got some records for, you know, uh, Christmas one year, um, my dad's friend's wife, and I'll never forget her, but she gave me uh, an Aerosmith record, she gave me a Kiss record, and she gave me a Sabbath record for Christmas. Nice. Uh, so I got into, uh, yeah, I got into that probably around like uh, 15, 16, I started getting into that. So uh, then I found out, you know, about touring and the lifestyle, and it just seemed kind of uh, fun. Yeah. 
That's great. So you were, you said you were like 15 or 16 before you even started playing bass. That's, a, that's very impressive. Oh, I was probably older than that too. I probably didn't start until I, yeah, probably 17 or 18 when I oh, started wow. even, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, you know, uh, putting all that timeline together, you know, you're starting to play music at 17 or 18, you know, uh, when Faster Pussycat really first kind of rolled around, you were maybe what, 23, 24 when all that started. So that's pretty yeah. impressive. Pretty impressive that within a couple of years, you know, from just starting, you're already, you know, in an iconic band, which they turned out to be and doing all those impressive things as far as your musical career goes with, you know, maybe not having 10, 15 years under your belt of, you know, just hammering out the stuff in your bedroom like some guys do. So that's that's very impressive when you start putting all the timelines together for that. Thanks. Yeah, I kind of was like... Uh... You know, I, I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to, like, you know, live a life of going to the office every day. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I really kind of I really kind of wanted to be, a, you know, a free spirit person and try. I really wanted to see the world. So I was like, how, you know, how can I see the world? And then once I figured out, you know, you could tour with bands and and you, you share this experience with your friends and everything. I just, you know, I practiced a lot. I kind of, uh, I was focused because I really kind of feel like I didn't have many choices for career wise, <laughs> you know? It was yeah. like, I didn't go to college. I, I dropped out of high school after 10th grade, um, but I just always knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to just be, you know, live a, a life of, I wanted, I wanted adventure. I wanted to see the world as best I could and not pay for it. Yeah. So, what yeah. better way to do that than to be a musician? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but I mean, I had like most of my friends, you know, they had plan B, they were going to go if, you know, in case they like uh, didn't, if the case they didn't make it, they would do this and, and they, or they would do that. And I never had a plan B, you know, I just kind of like figured, I would just keep going at it as long as it took. And, um, you know, when it was a great music scene in LA in the eighties and stuff. So I went and, uh, you know, that's when I hooked up with faster and everything, but, uh, you know, you, you just got to take chances if you, if you wanted it bad enough, you know? So, I mean, I kind of like had really limited choices. I feel so my design, my drive was pretty good, you know? Of course. And you know, that, <laughs> It, that seems to be a uh, universal experience with a lot of musicians as you know once that whole rock and roll experience kind of captivates you it's your mind's kind of on a one track system where you're like okay this is what i'm doing there is no backup plan i'm yeah. gonna make it work so i think that speaks a lot as you know somebody's work ethic and everything you know trying to make it work absolutely no matter what so yeah i mean there's no degree you know you can't like go four years and get your degree and there <laughs> you go man here's you know madison square garden tonight it's not like that yeah. you know it's like it's sitting it's sleeping on the beach it's starving it's uh you know the the whole pain you do is no money like not eating smoking uh cigarettes just to you know keep your appetite at bay yeah. <laughs> you know, just trying to hope that you know you end up with a good bunch of guys who have the same drive and vision as you and you can you know get there and, and try so you just you never know where you're going to end up you know you just end up like where you end up when you're a you know solo musician kind of trying to find a band you know I wasn't like a singer songwriter guy I didn't have my own stuff thing I just wanted to be in a band you know of course so I had to hopefully find you know cool people I got along with that had the same kind of you know, wanted the same kind of look and same kind of music that I kind of liked. And so, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a crapshoot, but you, you know, you just give it your best shot, I guess, you know, the, because the rewards are, the, are great, right? If you make it, the rewards are great. So I feel that the sacrifice must be equally as great. So like sleeping at the beach, sleeping in empty buildings, sleeping in buildings being constructed, sleeping surrounded by dog crap, you know, whatever <laughs> you had to do, to get there because every day was like you know got you a step closer find okay. a better band you know try to meet people and uh you know so it took some drive you know all these guys it took drive to to do there and, and then you know deal with the people in the band and all the stuff that goes with the music business as well you know you got to really want it or need it i guess 
Of course. And I know you said that there's really no degree for rock and roll, but what better way to get a degree in rock and roll per se when being out on the Sunset Strip in the 80s, you know, because everybody was out there trying to find their own spot, make their own mark. Right. So that's about as close as you can get, I guess, as to a rock and roll college is going through something like that and all the experiences you just listed. Yeah, you know, do you feel like you've earned it a little bit more kind of when you did the grunt work, you know? Of course. Uh, so you started as a roadie for an early incarnation of Danger Danger. Is there any experiences that kind of stick out from your days of being a roadie? Um, you know, I, I, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I kind of, uh, I mean, it was fun. We would just go out like they, they would play five or six nights a week and we'd tour all over the kind of tri-state area, New York, Connecticut, you know, Jersey, at Long Island. And they did top 40 mostly so you know we would just go out and play and I, I was making some money and they were making some money and uh, I'm still good friends with all of them oh nice so uh yeah absolutely uh the singer Mike Pond is my best friend we talk uh you know every few days and stuff so very cool um, it was just a good experience but then I decided you know I want to play I'm going to get back into it you know so I started playing again and uh you know, when I was looking for a band in L.A., I didn't even have a bass with me. I had to get my parents to send me one. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm a bass player. You want to come to practice? Uh, I don't have a bass with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking great. <laughs> so I had to get it, like, shipped out and sell that one and send me some money. And it was, you know, but uh, that was good. Hey, it's rock and roll, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I interviewed Britt Muscat here a week or two ago. Uh, kind of talk to me about working with him and the guys in Faster during the early days and how you originally linked up with those guys. Yeah. And the, uh, and the uh, motorcycle accident and all that stuff. But um, yeah, still talk to Tammy a little bit, you know, but that was just a great time too. I ended up in that band. The, uh, uh, and we got a deal uh, with Electra Records. And then the night we get a record deal, I get hit by a car man yeah so yes. you know i was like yeah that just happened so i spent three months in the hospital 10 surgeries and uh compound fracture hit and run uh so tammy was with me they're like you know they were in the car behind me and kind of saw it and tammy oh was, shit oh uh, yeah bro, uh, tammy had his hand on my leg and you know both covered in blood and he was trying to keep me calm and till the ambulance and stuff got there. So it was always like this, you know, blood brother connection with Tammy. We talk uh, every of few course. weeks. Of you know? course. Uh, Cause we went through this heavy thing together right on the Sunset Strip. Um, so, you know, it was a short lived experience. You know, I was so happy looking forward to it. Finally get a record deal and then we go to rehearsal and uh, somebody made a left turn in front of me and I just went flying and you know Jeez. so they had to let me go they got pressure from sorry they got pressure from uh, electric records to start their record so they came into the hospital and told me what was going on and i understood it was you know they had to go do their thing and i wasn't going anywhere for a while and then the bass player eric stacy came and visited me on his own and uh, introduced himself to me which has always been a uh, you know the place in my heart for him because i thought that was such a cool thing to do oh wow nice you know, to come and say hi. And I wished under different circumstances we were meeting, but you know, I was like, I totally understood, man. You know, they had to get their thing going. They were happy too and excited. So, so I ended up, uh, you know, getting out the Christmas. That, uh, I'm sorry, I got out of the hospital the day before Christmas. I, and I flew back to uh, another undisclosed location. And <laughs> then I got a call from Tracy asking me to join. So I, you know, I told him, man, I got a cast all the way up to my butt. He's like, you know, you'll heal. So I got on the next plane and flew back out to LA and started rehearsals with them on crutches, uh, six years on and off of crutches. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, it was tough, man. I mean, I could go on stage sometimes and I could feel my leg just like wobbling, like uh, it's going to snap like any second. Jeez. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. I had to like, you know, couldn't wear everything I wanted to wear. I had to kind of like uh, adapt stuff and, you know, because you get self-conscious about it, but you're just mostly like afraid that it's going to just crack. <laughs> yeah, of course, man. No doubt. That's, that's uh, some pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, it was a heavy, it was not as much fun as it sounds. <laughs> yeah, uh, so how did you originally meet uh, Tammy and Brent and start working with those guys? 
I think uh, at the time Melrose in Hollywood was uh, the street uh, where, uh, you, you know, like today it's a huge like shopping street. You walk down it and everything. And it's, it's like just the coolest stuff kind of on both sides. But at the time there was like two stores and uh, I think Tammy worked at one of them and we just started talking and stuff about it, you know? So uh, I lived right off of Melrose right there and I think we just became friends and, and I think that the bass player they had was leaving, so he asked me to play. Probably too at the Rainbow. I'd see him a couple times at the Rainbow, um, and just ended up with that. So yeah, we did a few shows and ended up getting a deal. And then you know the rest is a mess. Yeah, that's that's crazy, man. And glad to see you're still out and able to do your thing because that's you know some people that would that would put them down and out for a long time. And the fact that you were able to still go out and tour very soon after that injury, even though you were still dealing with all the other stuff is very impressive. And, you know, that's, that's very heavy stuff. I appreciate you sharing that story, man. Uh, thank you, man. You know, I was ready to go. I just got a record deal. And I'm like, yeah. oh, damn, but now I'm in the freaking hospital. I'm like, how is this possible? Yeah. And that's so very hard. unfortunate timing. <laughs> I've been trying so hard for, and, you know, for so long to get a deal. I finally get one. And I'm like, are you kidding me? But I think it turned out good in the end. And, um, you know, I had to deal with what I had to deal with. But I was young and I was ready to go, you know. So I was just like, let's go, man. Come on. Cool. So, you know, man, everybody out there in L.A. was trying to find that one band that would break them through it. And not only did you get put into one of those bands, Faster Pussycat, regardless that you were gone before the first album, you ended up in two of the most iconic bands, arguably, from that era in that Sunset Strip. So talk to me about those early days in L.A. Guns and what were some differences that, you know, in those early days of L.A. Guns versus some of your time in Faster Pussycat? Um, well, you know, it's hard to compare. I mean, um, it's hard to compare. I, you know, I, I did get lucky. I enjoyed both experiences. But, um, you know, L.A. Guns was the one that was, uh, you know, I, I, you know, that's the one I could do. I couldn't do Faster Pussycat. So... Uh, but, you know, we were all kind of friends and hanging around the same place, too. So, you know, a lot of it happened at the Rainbow and, and Melrose. We'd, you know, uh, so you just run into him. I mean, I run into Tracy because I had a tattoo and he had a tattoo. And so we just started talking nice. about uh, the tats. And then I'd see him like a week later and he got another one. And then I'd be like, OK, I got to get another one. And then, we, <laughs> you know, and then um, and then Mick. Uh, uh, Mick worked at a store on Melrose, a clothing store with, uh, we had a British owner, Alan Jones was a really cool guy. He owned like three stores on Melrose. So Tracy knew Mick. So we went to go see Mick at the store and we'd get some cool stuff. Sometimes we'd get cheap, uh, some stuff cheap and stuff. And so I met Mick and, you know, they were jamming together. And then eventually when their guy kind of left, Mick went over, Mick was playing bass and he ended up playing guitar. And then I came back in and filled in the bass. So it just kind of, you know, it just fell into place, man. It just, you know. Yeah, that's uh, that's very cool how that kind of happened twice, you know, how the bassist ended up playing guitar and inserted you. And then fast forward to you're in Steve Riley's version of the band now. Scotty used to play bass and now he's yeah. playing guitar. So that's crazy how that kind of happened twice. <laughs> yeah, right. It just kind of keeps happening. But uh, yeah, it, you know, it's I guess just timing and being, you know, uh, uh, building relationships a little bit and opportunities, you know, opening and being at the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, hopefully a good attitude getting me in there. Of course. And uh, fast forward in it a little bit. Uh, up until here recently, whenever you and Steve Riley started playing together again, uh, it had been quite a while since you guys had played together. I think whenever the classic lineup played those shows in 99 around that time, I think that was the last time you guys played together. So yeah. uh, what was it like to reconnect with Steve Riley after so many years of not playing with each other? Uh, you know, it was great, man, because I know exactly how he plays. And I know that we always got along. We never had an issue between us uh always the you know a great guy to be on tour with funny funny fucker you know um and just he you know he did so much of the work the behind the scenes the dealing with the man he dealt with everybody none of us did any business he was the only one who did any business for the band uh talking to the lawyers talking to the the booking agents the management the record company it was always him doing it so um 
So I felt in good shape. Uh, and, you know, playing with him again is just great because we, we had such a great connection as a, as a rhythm section together. We really could read each other really well and, uh, you know, made it easier. And he's solid as a rock, so made it easier for me. And, you know, we have eye contact during the, night, during the shows and, uh, you know, we make sure we hit those marks together. So it was great perfect, easy guy to jam with. So yeah, I was real excited. And then, you know, the only question was who else were we going to get? And when he mentioned Scotty, you know, I, I knew Scotty as a bass player too. So then I was like, you know, if he could play those parts, love to have Scotty. Cause every time I've met him, he's always cool, laid back, easy going. So that's what this whole vibe is. And then I think Scotty knew Kurt. So we flew uh, Kurt out from Florida to rehearse with us a few days in LA. And, you know, he was just a nice, easygoing, super talented guy. He plays guitar really well, too. He's a songwriter, um, you know, brought a lot to the table. So it was just a really easy kind of put together. But, I mean, Steve and I did this, you know, talk about it for a while. Like, if we do this, like, you know, I don't want to, like, do this and suck. I don't want to come out and not be good. It's got to be tight. The starts and the stops, you know. Of course. And, we live in different states, so we can't just get together. So it's all about doing homework and knowing these songs in and out. Then we work together on like the starts and the stops because that's where, you know, the high accident rate is. You know, if we don't stop yeah. start at the same time, it's terrible. So we really, you know, just have been the good communication with everybody and just, you know, and knowing that, you know, we, we got to be good. We got to be good live and we got to be tight. And there's, can, you know, can be no uh, more than uh, usual mistakes, you know. Of course. And uh, kind of touching on Kurt Frolic a little bit more. Me and him are actually playing a show together down at the uh, Kissmas Expo next month. Oh, good. In, uh, Sarasota, Florida. Yeah. Uh, me and him are doing a bunch of the classic Kiss tunes with a couple guys. Uh, but you talk about, you know, living in different states and me, Kurt lives in Florida. I'm in Kentucky. So we're going into this with no rehearsals. So I definitely, uh -huh. I feel that sentiment on you have to do your homework going into this, but luckily yeah, we're playing. Sure you know, those starts and stops, man. Oh yeah. And I mean, luckily we're playing kiss, kiss songs. So I right. mean, that, that stuff's kind of like a second language, you know, so right. that's, that's a little easier to just plug in and do that stuff like that. But, uh, talking about Kurt a little more, uh, when you guys brought him in for those rehearsals, was it pretty obvious from the get-go that he was going to be the guy from those that uh, those initial rehearsals? Yeah, it was pretty much. But I feel like uh, you know he was he had like he was nervous. He had some issues. He felt like having to fill in Phil's shoes, and that's not what we wanted. We we know he's a different person. So it's like, you know, you got to do your own thing, man, but you got to own it. So you just don't even worry about Phil, man. That's a whole different thing. You'll, you know, we don't want to be compared to that or trying to mimic that. We're doing our own version of it as it is now. And, uh, you know, we both, we all thought his voice was perfect for it. And he just, once he got comfortable with it and relaxed, you know, he just nailed it. It was done. Of course. And I think that's one thing that, you know, kind of resonates with everybody that's heard this album is that, you know, Kurt is being himself. He's singing like he naturally sings. It's, it's not like he's trying to sound like anybody or, you know, anything like that. It comes across as very genuine what he's doing on the album. Exactly. That's all we wanted. You know, we, it is what it is. And uh, we still want to play these songs and everything. So we're going to try to just do them right and do, uh, you know, do them right as best we can and um and everybody's you know really a band effort i mean everybody worked really hard on the record and everybody contributed and you know to the very last second i mean he was trying things in the vocal booth just to the very last till the clock ran out you nice know, couldn't <laughs> sing anymore and it's like i'm a stickler with my melody lines like i my melody lines are solid when I hear him, so I try to, but you have to try to explain that to the singer and then, you know, he's tired and it's like, but he really worked hard to make me happy and, and you know, have, uh, confident with him and everything. So yeah, it was just a great recording experience for us. Yeah, and uh, you know, kind of touching on that, uh, it really seems like you guys get along really well with each other. So did that create for just an overall better experience than maybe in the past on some other records, you know, just the cohesiveness of you guys just as friends and getting along like that? How did that translate over to the writing sessions for this? 
Yeah, exactly. That's because he's got a whole studio kind of thing in his house, um, you know, and he's a master on in all that, uh, like Logic or Pro Tools, whatever he uses kind of thing, you know, software, recording software. He's got that stuff down. So I would send him like, you know, some rough mixes and he would come back the next day with a few different twists and, the, and then I would send it back and back and forth. But, you know, really worked. Because we only had 10 songs. We only had a budget for 10 songs on this record, you know, so we, we just narrowed it down and really focused on them and, and made them as tight as we could. But we worked on, you know, to the last second on them. Of course. And I actually didn't know until I, I interviewed Kurt here about a month ago as well. Uh, I didn't know that uh, Steve was the one producing all this stuff as well, which is very impressive. You know, it kind of goes on to what you mentioned about his business mentality to where he's not just a one trick pony like he's just a drummer. He's he's kind of got the whole thing going for him. Yeah, he's been in a bunch of, you know, he's the, he's the guy who's always there in the studio till the end and everything. So he's got enough experience. And, uh, you know, he asked me if I was cool with it. I'm like, God, man, if you can't do it by now, you know, so go ahead, <laughs> you know, fucking run with it and uh, keep it in house. And I get to do the art direction on the record. So I'm happy with that. He takes care of that. We all yeah, I, I love the artwork on this, by the way. That Renegades cover is very cool. Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, so talk to me about working with Golden Robots. What's your relationship been like working with Mark and those guys over there? Well, the, you know, I think they're fabulous. I think that the best thing about Mark, uh, is one of the best things about him is that, uh, you know, he's a music fan and he's a music lover and he knows his music and his music history. And so it's not just business. It's, there's a lot of passion there. And that's what kind of separates it from, you know, some of the big houses back in the day that, uh, you know, were just doing it for the money. They don't, you know, they, they weren't someone that you could hang out with that you felt like was on the same page, you know. Of course. Tattoos, he loves hot, hot rods and motorcycles. And, you know, he knows, like he knew the band, he knew who we were, he knew our history. And so it was nice to, you know, feel, feel really good about being in a relationship with someone like that, that, you know, is not just in it for the you know whichever artist is making the most or you know not answering calls because you know madonna's on line one la guns on line two <laughs> okay give me line one you know? yeah of course you know it's so it's nice having someone yeah he always answers the calls and texts me back and stuff and you know so really good hopefully you know get to do another one uh by the end of this year go in and uh you know start writing again and uh, try uh do another one. Oh, nice uh well i'm loving the first one so if we can get a second one out of you guys i'll definitely be in line to get that one as well and i definitely share that sentiment with you know golden robot and them there's kind of a personal connection with these guys where it doesn't feel like you're walking into an office with a bunch of guys in a suit and tie and stuff like that it's yeah. it's kind of just like a no bullshit mentality and i love that about mark and all them it's that you're you're getting exactly what they tell you you're getting in every yep. aspect of being with this label. Yep, you know, that's why we wanted at this point in the career, it's like, you know, we want it easy, man. We just want to like get along, have fun, play some music, have some cool people, not get ripped off anymore. And, uh, you know, and everybody, you know, have a good time and stay busy and do something. Of course. Uh, so you and Steve Raleigh have known each other for going on almost 40 years now. How would you compare your and his relationship now to maybe when you or back in the early days of LA guns? Um, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's changed much. You know, it was always like good to see him in the morning and, uh, and then we'd go out and, uh, you know, do the show and sound check and, um, you know, and his wife's awesome too. So uh, it was just, it was just like, you know, seeing like your brother, man, that you haven't seen in a while. It was really easy. You know, we instantly uh, like, let's go. We know what we're doing here. Let's go. Let's do this. You know, that's great. And, you know, you mentioned it a second ago. You got to do all the graphic designs for all the stuff that L.A. Guns is putting out right now. And you have your own company. And sorry if I mispronounced this uh, Montauk Salvage Company. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's right. Montauk. Uh, yeah. Cool. So uh, talk to me about uh, how you kind of got started in graphic design and, you know, your decision to start your own company doing that. 
Um, yeah, started it a while ago, but I got into computers in, ni- in like 93. My brother had one and, okay. uh, and I would go over there and we'd smoke a dube and he would just show me, <laughs> cool, he would just show me cool shit on the computer. And I was like, oh man, that's so cool. So I kind of figured like, you know, you didn't have to be a Picasso on the computer that there were still like cool things that could be done, you know? Of course. So that, I'm not, you know, I can't really illustrate or anything like that. So my friend is an amazing illustrator. So he works with me on gigs. Like when we have a gig that someone needs uh, something hand drawn, I'll get him to do it. But he doesn't know anything about the computer. So I do all that. So, you know, we could cover a lot of stuff and it's just kind of, you know, tried to do my own thing and keep me busy and keep me sane. And there's some, you know, stay creative. There's some artwork up there. There's some photography up there. There's some... Uh, you know, whatever I kind of like, my my creative life kind of thing, I try to post and, you know. Like yeah, that. well, it, it's, it's very cool. Like I said, I, I loved all the artwork and that was something that kind of stuck out to me when I first started seeing the single artwork for all this stuff. I was like, damn, that looks cool because uh, I wanted to find out who was doing it. So, because I was kind of shopping around for everybody to, for people to do our artwork. And I was like, who's doing all this LA guns artwork. And then once I looked into it, I was like, Oh, it's Kelly doing all that. I was like, that's, that's awesome. How you guys were able to keep basically everything in house for this record between Steve producing it and you doing the artwork. And then of course the band playing on it. That's, that's very awesome. You were able to keep it in the house like that. Yeah. Thanks. I think so. Because, uh, you know, that I definitely have a, wanted to have a say in it so there's like you know there's no way I'm gonna let somebody else do it right now I think I could do it you know I think I could make our stuff uh, shit look cool and I read it the badge right away to to sort of give us our own identity you know so when you see that badge you know it's us now and um and uh always put our names up on there and stuff and uh just try to give us a uh, you know a cool look yeah of course and you know uh, loving it very much, loving the new album, and uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, one last thing before we get out of here: uh, okay. if you have, you got a personal favorite track off of the album? Uh, I'm gonna say, yeah, "Renegades" is my personal favorite. Of course, you can't go wrong with the title track. <laughs> and uh, you know i was talking to kurt about it i actually think that my favorite song uh especially of the singles that you dropped was the fourth single i love all that you are and that was okay. such a uh you know it was it kind of caught everybody off guard because the album was coming out that week we weren't expecting a single to be dropped earlier in the week as well so that was a yeah, very nice yeah, touch cool. on that a lot of people like different songs which is cool you know and it's not just like a one kind of one song thing so you know a lot of people are commenting on different songs that you know it's it's cool it's broader yeah and, and man crawl the first single what a what a great track to just come right out of the fucking gate with that was great and loving the whole album so Thank kelly I, I appreciate you so much coming and giving me some of your time uh everybody that's listening go check out renegades from la guns out on golden robot records on november 13th a fantastic album Kelly, me and you could say goodbye off air here in a second, but I'm going to go ahead and end the live show. So thank everybody for tuning in tonight.